All right, all right. What's up, people, man? I want to go into this story here. This is going to be one of two stories I'm going to do today on lives. So I have this first story that's going to come up uh, involving a New Orleans police officer who sits on death row. And matter of fact, these are going to be two stories, two live streams on the two police officers that sit currently on death row as they wait for their execution dates here on uh, one on the federal death row and her on the state death row. And these are two black officers who people, many people look at it, man, look how the system does. And they got out of all the cops that do shit and they get off on crimes. And when they get arrested, they never get shit like that. Now we got the two black officers facing the death penalty. Now the cases are different involving these officers and the kind of fucked up shit they got themselves twisted up in. And if you go back into the 90s of New Orleans, so those from New Orleans who probably lived during these time periods know because New Orleans had a major scandal going back into the early 90s. And I think this is kind of when you go back in the Master P movie, the guy who will be on the second live that I'm going to do, Lynn Davis, I think that's kind of loosely that that story that Master P does and I'm about it with Officer Friendly. And it's funny he, he used the name Officer Friendly because Officer Friendly is really community policing program is the name of those programs. But Officer Friendly, I think his character is depicted off of the second live I'm going to do at 4 p.m. West Coast time today. So it'll be about in two hours and do another live on the second officer that's on death row. But this woman who currently sits on death row, Antoinette uh, Frank, who in her situation, the fuck shit she did is way beyond me. So this is her. This is her accomplice who was an 18 year old at the time where they commit this crime that took place in, in uh side of the two Asian victims. Well, let me go back in here. The two Asian victims you see here inside of their parents restaurant, along with an officer that she worked a uh, second, you know, a security ship. Because one thing with law enforcement work is a lot of officers to make up income, especially New Orleans officers. That's why I, it was so much corruption down there in New Orleans in that department was the fact that they, these officers were so underpaid. There's so many scandals going there that officers will work second shifts. As officers in many departments across the country, they may work security at clubs, sports events, and shit like that. You may think they're civilian security guards or bouncers, a lot of them are officers. So this is the son of the restaurant owner who was killed during this uh 1995 crime, I believe the crime took place in 1995, uh, was this this young victim here. Uh, wait, let me see when did this crime take place. I think the crime did take place in 95, but she developed a relationship with a young 18-year-old dude who was all, all also in criminal shit, who she met after he was shot. So 17-year-old was killed in his parents' store. This 24-year-old lady was killed in her parents' store. And also the officer who Antoinette worked with, who was off-duty, working a second shift inside of these people's restaurant, who would lose his life. And they did him real foul, fucked up. He just had a newborn child. All right, so turn that light off, homie. So let me go into get ready for this story here. Y'all see the photos of it so you can get a depiction of who they are. And I'll run this video on on them let me say what's up to y'all as y'all roll in bruce gas in the building salute says on the case yes indeed fissiana in the building salute gregory x in the building salute and if, uh bruce gas saying salute to fissiana gregory x and saying salute to myself says i follow this one yeah oh you say you follow this one yeah this one is way out this is some crazy shit these officers were doing back then boxing mma salute because a lot of times it gets these stories get overlooked a lot of the scandals come about especially out of la you hear a lot of the police scandals you hear a lot of the nyp early 1980s scandals, uh, Chicago PD, uh, uh, early 90s scandals, Miami in the 80s, police scandals and shit. But this is one of the most sinister shit out of New Orleans. MF, uh, MFB says this woman was a psychopath. Yeah, she's psychopathic as fuck. And there's some shit that's going to come up at the end of her case that she may have done to her own fucking father. Bruce Gass says uh, the N.O. Uh, Nola says uh, is hot up for uh, cops. Says uh, she had red flags all her, uh, for all over her. Yes, indeed, she should have never been hired as a cop. But uh, without further ado, let me play this video clip here. 
on It Takes a Killer, a merciless triple homicide in New Orleans East, Louisiana. As law enforcement pieces together the mystery behind the bloodbath, they quickly learn there's way more to the murders than a robbery gone wrong. New Orleans, Louisiana, Friday, March 3rd, 1995, 11.05 p.m. Officer Ronnie Williams of the NOPD 7th District arrives at Kim On for off-duty security detail. The Vietnamese restaurant is on the far east edge of New Orleans East. 23-year-old Chow Vu and her siblings, 24-year-old Ha, 18-year-old Kwok, and 17-year-old Kwong, work at the establishment, which is owned by their family. Around 11.45, Officer Antoinette Frank, who also works out of the 7th District, arrives at the restaurant. Frank sometimes works security at the restaurant. She just got off duty and stopped by to grab some cold drinks before catching a midnight movie. Chow happily gives Antoinette a couple of free orange juices and sends her on her way. Then she instructs her siblings to start cleaning up. At 12.51 a.m., Antoinette... So what do you think that was about? Antoinette going in here, bringing the, going into the restaurant, get a free orange juice. If she's a scandalous, psychopathic woman, what do you think that was? Her reasoning behind stopping... To case out, see who's in there, uh, uh, wear options, go over her plan, salute the way B in the building says salute to myself in the chat. So let's continue on and see what happens. So she just stops in there briefly, gets orange juice, and let's see what happens next. Establish an alibi. That's a, yep, I think so as well. I think so. I think definitely is probably what she's done by stopping in there for that one time in case her prints come up. Uh, footprint, any of that type of stuff comes up, she'll have an alibi. Yeah, I stopped there earlier, grab me an orange juice, whoop, whoop, whoop. That's, that's a great answer on that one, most definite. Oh, 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 let me back that up. Not movie. Chow happily gives Antoinette a couple of free orange juices and sends her on her way. Then she instructs her siblings to start cleaning up. At 12.51 a.m., Antoinette calls the restaurant. She missed her movie and hopes she can come by the restaurant to pick up some food. Chow tells Ha to make steak and fries for Antoinette on the house. Antoinette shows up 10 minutes later with her nephew, who she introduces to the family. Chow locks the front door so no additional customers can enter and drops a key on the bar where Ronnie Williams is holding court. While Antoinette and her nephew eat, Chow cleans the bar top. Hawk sweeps the floor and Ha and Kwong attend to matters in the kitchen. Antoinette's nephew gets up and uses the bathroom by the bar. When he returns, they head for the exit. Ronnie can't find Chow's key, so Kwok uses his to let them out. Chow yells goodnight and tells Antoinette uh, not to worry about working. So, so the key shit. The key. So the one person that couldn't find their key, the other person uses theirs. So this is where things fucked up from him. It's always kind of these step by step, these sequences that turn into these events that go catastrophic for the families. The guy leaving because they trust him. It's cops in there. They're not looking into the fact that, man, are we living in a city with corrupt cops? People back in the 90s didn't believe cops did the shit that people within, you know, the, the cities would report about what cops were doing, how crooked cops were, how you couldn't trust them. So many other people didn't 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 take upon that that reality. They just thought it was something once the, the Rodney King shit broke, they just thought it was something exclusive to that department and something that was just. Uh, uh, some happen chance type shit that was caught on film and you know a one off situation with the Rodney King shit so she, they got cops inside this establishment they think nothing of it we ain't got we can be relaxed as we want to be leave our keys here we have the law right here inside the building so nothing to worry about but during this time excuse me during this time there's a lot to worry about especially within this NOPD all right so let me continue so this dude leaves his key let me back that part up about where they go to lock this door. Ronnie can't find Chow's key, so Kwok uses his to let them out. Chow yells goodnight and tells Antoinette not to worry about working security the following night, because Ronnie has it covered. Around 1.30 in the morning, Chow starts counting cash, her last duty before closing shop. She dumps more than $10,000 on a kitchen table, out of which she grabs some cash to pay Ronnie. When she walks the payment out to him, she sees headlights. Antoinette is back. Even though Antoinette is like family to the booze, Chow gets a bad feeling. She runs back to the kitchen, yelling to Quack and Ronnie, don't let her in. Chow grabs the money and hides it in the microwave. Quack watches Antoinette walk up to the front door and begins shaking it. When no one else lets her in, she opens it herself, using Chow's missing key. She heads for the back, pushing... Ain't that some cold shit? 
Ain't that some cold shit? She got a fucking key. And them not letting her in don't mean shit now. And the fact that she's an officer. So that means there's something on her hip, right? It's about to end bad for this family. Oh, oh, shit. I fucked that up. Hold on. Let me get back to that. Hold on. Hold on. When she walks the payment out to him, she sees headlights. Antoinette is back. Let me kill Antoinette is like family to the booze. Chow gets a bad feeling. She runs back to the kitchen, yelling to Quack and Ronnie, don't let her in. Chow grabs the money and hides it in the microwave. Quack watches Antoinette walk up to the front door and begins shaking it. When no one else lets her in, she opens it herself, using Chow's missing key. She heads for the back, pushing Quack and Chow back from the entrance to the kitchen. Antoinette tells Chow they need to talk. When Ronnie moves towards the kitchen, gunshots ring out. Antoinette lets go of Chock and Chow and runs towards the shots. Kwok and Chow head for the walk-in freezer. They whisper for Kwong and Ha to join, but they're in shock. Chow and Kwok hide in the freezer, but can hear voices shouting. When they peer out through the freezer window, they can see Antoinette and her nephew frantically running back and forth. Suddenly, gunfire erupts from nearby in the kitchen. Chow and Kwok watch through the window as Antoinette and her nephew peel out of the parking lot. They remain in the freezer for several minutes until they're convinced the danger is gone. Chow creeps into the dining area and finds Ronnie Williams motionless on the ground. She grabs her cell phone but can't get through. And Ronnie Williams, let me pull back up the names again. Ronnie Williams is the off-duty cop working security for extra money. And also the crazy thing about this, Ronnie Williams had just had a newborn child with his young wife. Uh, uh, so I think this is their second or third child at the time of, of this situation. To a motherfucking cop bust into this damn establishment where she worked as if these people didn't know who the fuck she was and commits this crime with an 18 year old she ended up falling in love with. So this is the other accomplice in this crime was an 18 year old. She fall in love. This 18 year old was a, was a dude who had, you know, New Orleans is bad as fuck. You know, cats and, and they know they, how they say they get it, how they live. So you imagine a nineties crack, Unemployment through the through the roof, no opportunities out there. So he end up he end up being able to mac up a fucking older woman who's a police officer, who's foul as fuck her damn self, along with many other cops in that police department and shit. And they going off pulling off crime. So he was already involved in a robbery situation or something or a shootout, some shit where he gets hurt. That's where she first meets him in a hospital, and then they establish a bond and shit. But you gonna hear more about what what what. What transpired? I think it's in this video. If not, I'll add more context to their relationship. Who to nine one one? Then the battery dies. Quok volunteers to run to a nearby friend's house and call the police. And as he's leaving, he sees Hart and Kwong dead in the kitchen. Nine one one receives Kwong's call at one fifty a.m. The dispatcher sends code one zero eight or officer in distress call out over the radio. Meanwhile, Antoinette Frank busts into the 7th District Police Station. She tells the desk clerk she's taking a squad car to respond to the 108. She immediately heads back out the front door. Within minutes, she's actually the first officer on the scene, back at Kim Ahn. Ain't that some shit? Ain't that some shit? That's the shit why people act so frantic when they deal with law enforcement shit. People want to act as if there's something wrong when people are paranoid. When cops pull them over and they have these fucking, you know, these responses that that are almost resistant type responses, because some people have lived through these sort of experiences or know this sort of history dealing with foul ass cops, especially at night. You see a lot of these situations happen at night or when people are out in these kind of almost remote off areas to where there's no one around they just don't trust being around certain cops because you don't know who you around with within some of these departments and the fact that this woman had just went into this business with a key to open it and gun people down in there she's going to be the first cop to respond back to the scene cold fucking shit and it probably wasn't much surveillance, so you already know she's probably about to go in there and finish this lady and the other dude the fuck off. Frank enters the front door. Officers Wayne Favre and Reginald Jacques arrive seconds later. Suddenly, Chow Vu runs out the front door in hysterics with Frank on her heels. Frank immediately tells Favre that three masked gunmen were involved in the shooting and could still be on the premises. Officer Yvonne Favre, Wayne's wife, now arrives. Chow jumps into her arms and refuses to let go. Antoinette approaches and asks where she and her brother hid and what happened to their other siblings. Confused, Chow responds that Antoinette should know because she was there. 
Frank says she doesn't know and retreats back into the restaurant. Inside, Wayne Fard checks Ronnie Williams, but there's no pulse. Williams has suffered three shots, the first of which came from less than two feet away to the right side of his neck, which would have killed him instantly. Yvonne walks Chow back inside to the kitchen to check on Ha and Quan. They're both lying on the ground, dead. Yvonne watches in shock. And, and, and see, that's ignorant shit from the police department right here and, and how flawed this Louisiana police department was. That you don't bring a victim of a crime back on a crime scene, stupid fucks. This is why so much ill shit went on in Louisiana. Probably why a lot of people out there in Louisiana don't trust shit. Slew my brother Sirs in the building, Don Zeeb in the building. So then this happened in the 90s. Yeah, this is from the 90s. That these officers will bring this woman back in there. This woman would tell the officers, they this lady. So let me back that shit up. Let me back this shit all the way up. From how this woman shows up at the killing these people, she rushes into a precinct in the area, takes some keys, and rushes out to the damn scene. She is an officer and try to be the first one on the scene, possibly to finish off the other two survivors. There's some wicked shit. Now we'll start to experience why you can't make the racial comparisons of why these two officers that I'm going to speak on today who are black, who are on death row awaiting executions. You'll see in the sinister side of what these motherfuckers did. Antoinette Frank busts into the 7th District Police Station. She tells the desk clerk she's taking a squad car to respond to the 108. She immediately heads back out the front door. Within minutes, she's actually the first officer on the scene, back at Kim Ahn. Frank enters the front door. Officers Wayne Favre and Reginald Jacques arrive seconds later. Suddenly, Chow Vu runs out the front door in hysterics with Frank on her heels. Frank immediately tells Favre that three masked gunmen were involved in the shooting and could still be on the premises. Officer Yvonne Favre, Wayne's wife, now arrives. Chow jumps into her arms and refuses to let go. Antoinette approaches and asks where she and her brother hid and what happened to their other siblings. Confused, Chow responds that Antoinette should know because she was there. Woo! Bingo! You should know you was there. Don't you? They had to fuck these officers up on the scene. They had to fuck these officers up on the scene right here. When that woman stated that shit, that shit had to drop the heart of fucking Frank. This woman's in the arms of another officer on the same department, and she makes that statement. But why would this other officer walk this woman back inside the restaurant to see her dead relative? You should have put that woman in the car, got her down to the pre to homicide or whatever. That's how you do that shit. Frank says she doesn't know and retreats back into the restaurant. Inside, Wayne Fard checks Ronnie Williams, but there's no pulse. Williams has suffered three shots, the first of which came from less than two feet away to the... And this is another way that, that Frank fucked herself off. This is a cop that they killed right side of his neck, which would have killed him instantly. Yvonne walks Chow back inside to the kitchen to check on Ha and Quan. They're both lying on the ground, dead. Yvonne watches in shock as Antoinette walks back and forth all over the crime scene, which is against standard protocol. Wayne comes back into the kitchen and asks Antoinette about the supposed masked gunman. She claims they fled down Bullard Avenue in a dark car. All three officers then escort Chow back into the dining area. Yvonne asks who might have done this to her family. And, and, and this is the other shit. In the restaurant, they asking this woman these questions. How dumb can officers fucking be? This is why New Orleans is so flawed with all this fucking scandal shit. The department full of fucking idiots. Short black man with gold teeth and says he came into the restaurant earlier with Antoinette. Sergeant Eddie Rance and Detective Ooh, Marco Demo of the homicide. This case is busting open. What did the woman say while interrogating? She came the dude who they look is a suspect came in the restaurant with Antoinette. Oh, shit. They fled down Bullard Avenue in a dark car. All three officers then escort Chow back into the dining area. Yvonne asks who might have done this to her family. Chow describes a short black man with gold teeth and says he came into the restaurant earlier with Antoinette. Sergeant Eddie Rance and Detective Marco Demma of the Homicide Unit arrive at Kim On around 2.30 a.m. Officer Williams' body has been removed from the scene. Detective Demma finds his empty holster on top of the bar. He also learns Williams' wallet was nowhere to be found. Demma assesses the situation as a robbery gone wrong, especially after Chow informs him the money she hid in the microwave was gone. Behind the bar, near the spot where cops find Williams' body, investigators find empty 9mm shell casings. They find similar casings and bullet fragments all over the kitchen near the bodies of Ha and Quan Vu. 
The gunman fired more than nine shots at the siblings. Ha suffered at least two shots to the head. Kwong had multiple gunshot wounds to his head and chest. So look how sinister these motherfuckers is. This is some sick minded shit from some real psychopaths that they slaughtered these fucking people. They slaughtered these people and enjoy that shit. To plug that many shots in the people, stand over them, do that shit. You a sick motherfucker, and there should be no remorse in these courts. I ain't I ain't with with supporting criminal motherfuckers. I believe in 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 the correction system. Some people belong in that. I ain't one of these. I'm from I'm a, I'm I'm a hood bound motherfucker, but I'm a righteous minded motherfucker. I don't support criminal bullshit because a lot of criminal bullshit is a lot of punk ass shit from bitch made people who get excuses from bitch made people who support the motherfuckers and always talking about freedom. Fuck these people. Trey in the building. What's up, bro? Say what's up myself in the chat. Motherfuckers need to clean shit up. And first, the cleanup comes from checking your homies who be foul on shit. And these motherfuckers right here, this bitch and this young ass dude that he 18 doing this kind of ill shit, motherfuckers sick. So let me back that up. And the best believe they're going to do fucking analysis on these bullets and analysis on that woman. That woman fucked up. To do this shit made no fucking sense. You're an officer. You should know what they're going to do. But it all comes from what they say this woman didn't get when she going through that academy. No, made no sense. She ended up on the department. The bitch is sick. Millimeter shell casings. They find similar casings and bullet fragments all over the kitchen near the bodies of Ha and Quan Vu. The gunman fired more than nine shots at the siblings. Ha suffered at least two shots to the head. Kwong had multiple gunshot wounds to his head and chest. While CSI processes the crime scene, Sergeant Rance sits down with Antoinette Frank. Rance asks Frank to recount the events of the evening. She admits to being at the restaurant earlier before the shooting to eat with her nephew. Boom, Frank that's, they left. Yeah, there, there you go. Like Dad said, to establish her alibi. To establish her alibi, she brought him in there to eat just in case they came up after these murders. And when she's being interrogated, yeah, I came in there with my nephew, who really ain't her nephew. It's a dude she in there having a fucking relationship with. And there's going to be some other stupid shit this bitch gets caught doing. Watch this shit. This shit. This chick is dumb as fuck. But she came back later. As she was getting a drink from the kitchen, she heard gunshots coming from the dining room, which sprang her into action, ushering the employees out of the back door. Ha and Kwong didn't listen and stayed in the kitchen. Rance asked Frank why she drove to the station to report the shooting instead of calling it in on a radio or cell phone. The question flusters Frank doesn't really have an explanation. Rance leaves Frank to get the rundown from Chow and Kwok, who's returned from his friend's house. Kwok explains how he and Chow hid in the freezer, while Antoinette and her nephew ran around the restaurant yelling, shooting, and rummaging through the area where the family usually stored the cash. Neither Kwok nor Chow saw who pulled the trigger, but Kwok confirms there were no masked gunmen, which leads Rance to return to the dining room to confront Frank about her account. Frank finally admits that her nephew is actually 18-year-old Rogers Lacaz. And, and, and this is the other thing. They doing this shit inside the restaurant, man. Hopefully they clean this whole department up and get rid of all the stupid motherfuckers that work at the New Orleans police. Why New Orleans is such a fucked up city? You can't clean it up with, with stupid ass police work like this. And says he was in the car when she returned to the restaurant for the third time that night. She didn't want him coming inside because he'd recently talked about robbing the place. Detective Demma comes over and asks Antoinette if she has a firearm with her. Antoinette says no, but when Demma pats her down, she lifts a 38 caliber handgun from the waistband of her pants. He subsequently places her under arrest for murder. Dumb bitch. Just before 4 a.m., as cops transport Frank to police headquarters, she gives up a couple of addresses where they can find Rogers Lacaz. Minutes later, officers surround the apartment of Lacaz's brother in Gretna. They take Rogers into custody without incident. He's shocked and scared to learn that Antoinette has him twisted up in a murder investigation. Chow and Kwok hid in the walk-in freezer when the shooting went down, but managed to see Antoinette and Rogers rummaging through the restaurant looking for cash. More than $10,000 is missing. Despite being on site for the shooting, Antoinette suspiciously reported the incident in person to her precinct, the 7th District, then returned to the scene as the first responding officer. When questioned at the scene, she attempts to paint herself as a hero, but her story doesn't square with the evidence of Chow or Kwok's eyewitness accounts. New Orleans Police Headquarters, Saturday, March 4th, 1995, 6 a.m. Detectives formally interview Kwok and Chow Vu. Kwok explains how Antoinette came into the restaurant three times that night. The second time, there was a gold-toothed man with her. She called her nephew. The nephew kept staring at him and made him nervous. Kwok says Antoinette somehow obtained Chow's keys. 
which she used to let herself in the third time she returned to the restaurant. He claims the gold-toothed man did the shooting while Antoinette watched, but both of them participated in searching the restaurant for cash. Chow adds how Antoinette had lied to Officer Yvonne Farb that she didn't know what had happened. She and her brother both pick Rogers Lacaze out of a photo lineup as the shooter. Meanwhile, bad. officers execute a search warrant on the apartment Lacaze shares with his girlfriend, Renee Brady. Inside a bedroom dresser, they find a box of 380 ammo and an NOPD summons dated January 30th for failure to control his vehicle. The issuing officer was Ronnie Williams. Investigators asked Renee where Rogers was the previous evening. She claims it was home with her until 1 a.m. Wait, 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 wait. Ronnie Williams is the guy. So this is some crazy, crazy turn of events. This is Ronnie Williams, the guy he will fucking end up killing. So he gets a traffic ticket and a summons, and the guy he ends up killing is this dude who wrote the ticket to where he ends up having to go to court. Ain't that some wild shit? Ain't that some wild shit? Ain't this some wild fucking shit? execute a search warrant on the apartment Lacaze shares with his girlfriend, Renee Brady. Inside a bedroom dresser, they find a box of 380 ammo and an NOPD summons dated January 30th for failure to control his vehicle. The issuing officer was Ronnie Williams. Investigators asked Renee where Ronnie Williams was, was the previous evening. evening. She claims it was home with her until 1 a.m. and he went to Mr. C's pool hall with his brother Michael till 2. After that, Roger yeah. stayed yeah. at Michael's across the river in yeah. Gretna. And then here go these motherfucking dumb bitches, man. My daughter or, or none of my kids better ever be no guinea pig, bullshit, lying motherfucker for some old fucked up individual. Salute Box MMA. Yeah, this story wild as fuck. It's, it's going to continue to get wild. But ain't that some shit? Because the way he killed this officer was like, did you do this shit to this officer? Because it's the officer who pulled you over for driving recklessly. And then so happened this day you meet this motherfucker on the day you rob in a restaurant. That's some way out shit. God damn, how can life turn? The officers know Renee's lying. At 7 a.m., Sergeant Eddie Rance and detectives Marco Demma and Richard Marino interrogate Antoinette Frank. Antoinette verified that she and Rogers ate at Kiman. She claimed it was Rogers' idea to eat in the restaurant, that that was when he started shooting. Her colleagues know she's lying, as Quack and Chow were clear that she'd come back later with a stolen key. Antoinette maintains that she led people out of the restaurant when the shooting went down, then went it's back missed, inside to check on Ronnie Williams. She claims that's when Rogers went into the kitchen and shot Ha and Kwong Vu. Antoinette is adamant she never touched or fired any weapon. According to Frank, Rogers looked for money but didn't find any, so they left. As they drove away, he allegedly threatened to kill her if she talked. Frank is repeatedly asked yeah, if she pulled her weapon or used her police training in any way. She responds by saying that when she finally thought to do so, Rogers had his gun in her face and said he'd shoot her. Just before 9 a.m., Demma, Rance, and Detective Patrick Young go in on 18-year-old Rogers Lacaze. Rogers blames the whole thing on Antoinette, saying it all began when she and Chow had words, possibly over Antoinette's off-duty security hours being given to Ronnie Williams. Rogers says Antoinette told him, I'm going to get that mother effer. Rogers claims Antoinette fired the first shots while he was standing near the doorway. Then she went into the kitchen and shot the others. The detectives know this is false, as she had her hands on Chow and Kwok per their statements as the first shots rang out. Roger says after they left, Antoinette dropped him off at his apartment and said she was going to report the crime to the station because nobody would ever believe she was involved. Demma asks Lacaz what guns they had with them. Lacaz says Antoinette gave him a 38 while she had a 9mm she'd taken out of evidence lockup and reported stolen two weeks prior. This implies premeditation. Investigators end their interview with Rogers and immediately take a second crack at Antoinette. After briefing Antoinette on Rogers' allegations against her, she admits the night before the shooting, Rogers and asked her about robbing Kim Ahn. She says she told him it was a bad idea because of the police presence, but took him there to get some food nevertheless. According to Frank, as they were about to pull out of the parking lot after eating, Rogers insisted he needed something to drink. That's when she went back, knocked on the door, and Ronnie Williams motioned for her to come in. Frank claims that when she went back to see Chow about getting the drinks, Roger snuck in and began shooting. Seconds later, he appeared. She, she just keeps digging bigger and bigger and bigger holes for herself. Every time she keeps coming up with a story, it's always some new lie, new lie, new lie. And this is digging her case worse. Uh, uh, like to say, the survivor said, you open the fucking door, lady. Don Zivi says, is it wrong to admit? Since I'm getting turned on, uh, man, get out of here, man. All right, let me continue on. At the back of the restaurant where she was and said several times, 
shoot those mother effers. Frank says Rogers handed her one of the two guns he had, and it went off in her hand. When the detectives ask Frank to clarify, she finally confesses that she shot Ha and Quan Vu, but Quan didn't die until a cause shot him multiple times to finish him off. Another story. Frank says that place. after the shooting, the cars took his gun back and they searched the restaurant for money. She insists he held a Because what, what she also knows that's coming down the line from this crime she committed, she trying to save herself from this fucking death penalty shit. Or thinks she gonna buy herself from life in prison. Like, chick is over with for you. Detectives ask Frank to clarify. She finally confesses that she shot Ha and Quan Vu, but Quan didn't die until a cause shot him multiple times to finish him off. Frank says that after the shooting, the cars took his gun back and they searched the restaurant for money. She insists he held a gun to her back the whole time so she couldn't pull a weapon. Several days later, ballistics tests come back indicating that the shells found near the bodies of Ronnie Williams, Fong Vu, and Ha Vu all came from the 9mm Beretta Frank had reported stolen just weeks earlier. Coming up, the strange union of an unfit cop and a high school drug dealer. Oh, not about to go on how these fools met. Which is wicked, man. This is sick bitch. Fuck her whole career off. On March 4th, 1995, just hours after Quan Vu, Ha Vu, and off-duty police officer Ronnie Williams are gunned down inside a New Orleans, Louisiana restaurant, authorities have two suspects behind bars on suspicion of first-degree murder. 23-year-old rookie NOPD officer Antoinette Frank and 18-year-old Rogers Lacaz. Under questioning, Rogers and Antoinette each blame each other for the shooting. However, Antoinette does eventually admit that she shot Ha and Quang Vu. Chow and Kwok, who'd hidden in the restaurant freezer, identify Rogers as the person who shot Officer Ronnie Williams. Gretna, Louisiana, Saturday, March 25th, 1995, 2 a.m. Law enforcement executes a no-knock search warrant on the apartment of Rogers Lacaz's brother, Michael. As officers spread out through the residence, they quickly find a piece of paper with a handwritten notes on the back. It's a list of Rogers' supposed activities on the evening of March 3rd into the early morning hours of the 4th. The list reads, 8.45 p.m., Shoney's. 9 to 9.10, went to Antoinette's house. 9.20, watching TV and talking on the phone. 12.45 to 1 a.m., Michael picks up to go to Mr. C's pool hall. 1.05 to 1.55 a.m., playing pool. 2 to 2.15 a.m., return home. Officers interview Michael Lacaz on the spot. He says the timeline was made up by Roger's girlfriend so they could all corroborate the same alibi, an alibi he admits isn't true. According to Michael, his brother sent him a page at around 2 a.m. on the night of the shooting. When Michael returned the page, Rogers told him he needed to be picked up as something bad had happened involving Antoinette. Michael swung by Renee's place and asked what happened. Rogers told him Antoinette knocked on the door of Kim on, an officer opened it, and he shot the officer. Rogers claimed Antoinette shot some other people inside, but some got away. On Monday, March 27th, Detective Marco Dema visits the Chevron near Michael Lacaz's apartment. Two days prior, Mary Williams, the widow of Officer Ronnie Williams, had called NOPD to report a suspicious $15.29 charge. Ah, this opens the case even more. So he's dead. This sick-ass young fool has this dude's credit card and is using it. I'm telling you, man, it's a lot of bitch-made shit from these people. That's why I don't, I don't rock with freeing motherfuckers that just think the system always wrong and the system always full of racist shit. Some niggas just fucked up and flawed than a motherfucker. On his credit card statement, the charge was from the Chevron on the night of the shooting and couldn't have been executed by Ronnie. Demma and clerk John Ross spend two hours sifting through a bag of old transaction receipts until they find a mysterious charge, which is timestamped 2.29 a.m. Demma shows Ross a six-pack. He identifies Rogers Lacaz as the person who made the $15.29 gas purchase just hours after the shooting at Kim On. Ross tells Demma he's certain it was Rogers because he sees him and his brother Michael frequently at the gas station. On April 28, 1995, an Orleans Parish grand jury indicts Rogers Lacaz and Antoinette Frank on three counts of first-degree murder each for the killings of Ronnie Williams, Quan Vu, and Ha Vu. Rogers and All right, let me pause that real quick, because if you go into the store and you begin to see photos, when you pull up photos of the suspects involved in this situation. So this is a photo from the crime scene inside that kitchen where these people meet their fate. Uh, you see pictures of, here is Antoinette uh, Franks here on the scene. You see a bunch of officers. So this is during her trial. 
So this is in, during her trial in September. They bring her, the jury and judge inside the restaurant as they do a tour of it, I guess, to kind of get a layout as the trial goes on to paint the picture. Here is him before her. So this is during his trial in July. They, you know, the jury judging him. They take a, a tour of this restaurant because you may wonder, like, damn, this is the restaurant here because you see Kim, whatever, Kim Vaughn's restaurant or whatnot, where the where some months earlier he in there annihilating the whole fucking family and shit. So he goes, I wonder how that uh, impacted him during the trial of being back inside this restaurant where he'll commit this crime that put his ass on death row. So he's inside the restaurant as the jury is in there and they're going through this part of the case. So this is in July and September during her part of the trial. She's brought in there as well. Uh, this is her arrest photo. You can see the look on this bitch face. Fucking sick ass bitch. And this is probably one of the most recent uh, photos of her. She's aged bad. Uh, this is how she fucked her life up. She's a nice looking chick. But something real sick and sinister in her mind, along with a lot of other cops in that in that department. That's why I'm gonna highlight the other uh other officer in the next story. He real fucked up. The next officer you're gonna hear in this next story is real fucked up. I may keep my time the same, but uh yeah, I'm gonna keep the time the same. I ain't gonna change the time, but he real foul as fuck, this next officer. She foul as hell herself though. Come on. Ross tells them he's certain it was Rogers, because he sees him and his brother Michael frequently at the gas station. On April 28, 1995, an Orleans Parish grand jury indicts Rogers Lacaz and Antoinette Frank on three counts of first-degree murder each for the killings of Ronnie Williams, Quan Vu, and Ha Vu. Rogers and Antoinette's trials are separated and put on the docket for a fast turnaround. During the four-month lead-up to trial, prosecutors scrambled to figure out the relationship between Frank and Lacaz and how it led to murder. Antoinette Frank was born in Opelousas, Louisiana in April 1971 and raised alongside three brothers. Antoinette splits her time in high school between McDonough in New Orleans and Opelousas High in Opelousas. At both schools, she shows an interest in law enforcement, graduating in 1989. In April 1991, 20-year-old Antoinette applies to the New Orleans Police Department. As part of the screening, she undergoes two psychological exams. Dr. Penelope Drawl gives Antoinette the lowest possible score for tolerance open-mindedness and impulse control and the next to lowest ranking on stability maturity and probable adjustment to police work see the psych exam was on point about her and the psych exam is like one of the one of the first phases after you pass like written exams you pass physical exams departments that put you through the psych exam and the psych examination evaluate this chick perfectly but because of the scandals inside of the New Orleans police, them fucking in a real uh, uh, recruiting, you know, kind of a, a, a recruiting shortage, it seemed like they were just taking anybody. This woman should have should have never been allowed at the felon the psych exam. Usually that's what fa fails a lot of uh, uh, recruits going through a selection process with police and shit. Control detects Antoinette has problems with authority. Dr. Philip Scuria concludes that Antoinette is unacceptable with regard to integrity and forthrightness. He determines that she's unfit for the police academy. Man, that's Frank like spends the next several months right. campaigning to redeem herself with the NOPD. She obtains multiple letters of recommendation, which may or may not have been forgeries. She also gets a second opinion on her psyche evaluation, which she passes in November 1992. The police academy accepts Cadet Frank despite the warning signs. She earns her badge by August 1993. Frank's first four months go horribly. She doesn't get along with her assigned partners, and a training officer suggests that she return to the academy. Then, on November 25, 1994, Antoinette and her partner respond to a shooting. As a result of a dope deal gone wrong, Rogers Lacaz is en route to the hospital with serious wounds. Lacaz had been dealing drugs since dropping out of high school in 10th grade. A few days after the incident, Frank presents a photo lineup to Lacaz at the hospital and ends up befriending him. Over the ensuing three months, she chauffeurs him to look for work, buys him clothes, and gets him a pager and a cell phone. Against protocol, Antoinette lets Rogers ride in the squad car and even move it. Earlier, on the night of the Kim Ahn shooting, she had even brought- Y'all hear, hear what this stupid ass chick was doing? Let me back that shit up again. Let me back that shit up again. So y'all know who Lacoste, he's the other suspect. 18 year old, probably 17 at the time this shit happened. This motherfucker, he must have been really putting it on her ass to be driving around in her police car. How fucking dumb can you fucking be? As a father, 
this dude, her father didn't kick her in her ass enough or, or pass on lessons on what you do and don't do for no sick minded motherfucker. Then, on November 25th, 1994, Antoinette and her partner respond to a shooting. As a result of a dope deal gone wrong, Rogers Lacaz is en route to the hospital with serious wounds. Lacaz had been dealing drugs since dropping out of high school in 10th grade. A few days after the incident, Frank presents a photo lineup to Lacaz at the hospital and ends up befriending him. Over the ensuing three months, she chauffeurs him to look for work, buys him clothes, and gets him a pager and a cell phone. Against protocol, Antoinette lets Rogers ride in the squad car and even move it. Earlier, on the night of the Kim Ahn shooting, she had even brought him along on a residential call and referred to him as a trainee. By the end of that night, Rogers had taught Antoinette more about being a criminal than she taught him about being a cop, as three people were dead and thousands of dollars were missing. New Orleans, Louisiana, Monday, July 17, 1995. The Rogers Lacaz murder trial begins at Orleans Parish Criminal Court. The prosecution asserts that Lacaz is a cold-blooded killer who shot Officer Ronnie Williams dead at Kim Ahn restaurant on March 4th, 1995. As for Ha and Kwang Vu, they argue it makes no difference who pulled the trigger because both Lacaz and Frank intended to kill in the course of the robbery. Lacaz's defense team argues that Rogers didn't commit the crimes. Instead, Antoinette Frank duped him in a plot to rob the restaurant and blame it on an easy target. Prosecutors call multiple witnesses to debunk Roger's alibi and illustrate his intent to participate in the crime. The manager of Mr. C's pool hall testifies that he saw Michael Lacaz at the establishment on March 4th, but definitely did not see Rogers. Two clerks from the New Orleans East Walmart state that on March 3rd, 1995, Antoinette and Rogers inquired about buying ammo for a 9mm handgun. Neither Antoinette nor Rogers owned a 9, except potentially the gun Antoinette reported stolen from police lockup. Chow Vu takes the stand. She points out Rogers Lacaz as the person she saw shooting at the restaurant. The defense counters Chow's testimony by raising the possibility that Antoinette's brother, Adam Jr., was her accomplice, not Rogers. Adam has a criminal record, but it's physically obvious no one would mistake five foot two Rogers for six foot five Adam Frank Jr. Oh, so Rogers, Rogers, Lacaz cool. takes the Rogers stand. a fucking midget, man. <laughs> What well, fucking midget Mac in there knocking her the fuck down and she doing crimes with a midget? And in his own defense. Lacar sticks with his alibi and the sissy didn't buy gas with Ronnie Williams' credit card, the possession of which is damning proof that he'd been at the crime scene. But on cross-examination, Lacar trips up by admitting he'd been with Antoinette Frank when she ordered food from Kim Ahn. The order came in at 12.51 a.m., at which time he claimed he was already at the pool hall with his brother. On July 21st, Holy 1995, the jury convicts Rogers Lacar on three counts of first-degree murder. He's sentenced to the death penalty. Good job, Jerry. Orleans Parish Criminal Court, Tuesday, September 5th, 1995. Disgraced cop Antoinette Frank stands trial for the murders of Ronnie Williams, Ha Vu, and Quan Vu. Prosecutors theorized that Frank's motive for murder was her anger about getting cut out of the paid off-duty security detail at Kim Ahn. Frank's defense team paints her as an innocent woman who tried to help a troubled young man, Rogers Lacave, but ended up being forced to participate in his schemes. The state's case against Antoinette Frank is virtually identical to the one they presented against Lacaz, with one major exception, her interrogation tape. The damning tape clearly shows Antoinette admitting to shooting Ha and Kwang Vu. Frank's defense team has subpoenaed almost 40 witnesses, but don't call on any of them to testify. Antoinette does not take the stand in her own defense. On September 12th, the jury takes just 22 minutes to find Antoinette Frank guilty on three counts of first-degree murder. They recommend the death penalty, which the judge affirms. In 2000, Frank appeals her conviction, arguing that prior abuse could have been a mitigating factor in her case. She tells a forensic psychiatrist that her father displayed... Yeah, this is the thing. I hate when motherfuckers go into court and want to bring up psychological shit or mental illness. Fuck that. That's more the reason to keep your mentally ill ass behind prison. That mental health shit ain't no fucking excuse for killing people or doing ill shit to you, uh, uh, other people, and now they play a, a, a sick-minded motherfucker as a victim. No, keep the motherfuckers away from everybody. Prison is perfect for them. So the bitch trying to run and act like her father did this and that to her. Uh, uh, fuck this bitch. Where the chair at? Champion Hard in the building. Salute to OG Champion Hard. Says salute to myself. Says and the brothers in the chat. Says I remember when this sh uh, shit happened. Says crazy as shit. Oh yeah, this is crazy. But the next one gonna be even crazier. After I go on live right after this, probably an hour after I finish this one. Don ZB says Rogers was a victim. 
she abused him. Yeah, the midget, midget Rogers. Now nah, Rogers need to stay his ass in jail too. Fuck that victim shit. Kill that motherfucker too. Bruce Gass says they always blame their uh, dead fathers. Facts, man. This a uh, crazy bitch. So I'm glad she told that story that this and that. So your mind is fucked up, bitch. All right, so you stand in here. Bizarre and physically threatening behavior, including an incident where he killed a family pet in front of her. Antoinette also alleges he sexually abused her from age 9 to 19, which resulted in multiple aborted pregnancies. This in November 1995, bitch. eight months after Frank had been sent to prison on murder charges, police recovered male human remains from a shallow grave beneath her. Now, there you see is a skull of her father. This is what he's supposed to look like. This is what he looked like. Supposed to look like this. This is what he looks like. After a dog happened to be digging, you know, dogs like to dig for shit. They like where bones at. And they dig this shit up where her father just disappeared. You know, neighbors had seen the father working on her home and this and that. And all of a sudden he just disappeared and shit. This is the type of shit that some officers have as skeletons in their fucking closet. And why police officers should look be looked into much deeper. Oh, the man's skull with a gunshot wound. No attempts are ever made to ID the remains, but many suspect they belong to Antoinette's father, who lived with her at the time she reported him missing in September 1993. His alleged abuse theoretically could have damaged her psyche prior to Kim on triple homicide. Because Antoinette had refused pretrial meetings with mitigation experts, the judge denies her appeal. Most of us in law enforcement don't even see people like Antoinette Frank as police officers. They are simply criminals who use their position to commit crimes. And when Antoinette Frank and Rogers Lacaze got together, it was the perfect recipe for this triple homicide. All right, man. Hope you all enjoyed that one, man. That, that one was twisted crazy. But the other side to this shit is what so they both received the death penalty so they both end up getting the death penalty in this case but turn of events popped off for rogers lecrae a uh, uh, midget little midget motherfucking uh co-conspirator he was resentenced so I believe his shit was in 2008 2017 to 2018 it was he received an appeal went all the way up to the supreme court and the reason for granting him this appeal and this overturn of his uh, execution sentence and giving him life uh, without the possibility of parole was because there was an officer, a former officer who served on the jury. And that was illegal to have an officer, uh, any kind of former law enforcement individual on the jury, uh, especially in a case like this. And so. That ended up getting his his conviction uh, overturned. So he's sitting in there with life in prison. So his sentence was commuted to uh, life life in prison without the possibility of parole. So he won't be going into an execution chamber, but the bitch would. Crazy, sick, police badge, fucking criminal element of this crime will be sitting in prison for the murders of these three individuals who lost their lives over some nonsense. And this woman ruin, ruined her career, her future, anything else, her, uh, 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 you know, opportunities of raising her own family and shit. But good thing she ain't raised no family. She's been teaching her kids some sick shit and making up excuses. Chambi Hart says, don't understand how she got past the uh, psycho, uh, psychological test says to even be a cop. Because New Orleans, New Orleans is fucked up. That whole department was fucked up. Watch when I go into this next one. Give me about an hour. I'll be back on here. So I'm going to end this one, folks, and I'll be back with the Lynn Davis story. Lynn Davis is a foul-ass fucking dude, and the way they cracked his shit is cold, man. I can't wait for this one. I'm out of here, folks. Peace, peace. Catch you guys on the next one. Hit that like button. Dislike. I don't give a fuck. Hit something. Peace. <laughs>